Good morning, wherever you are. I think we are live. Happy, thank you, phone. Happy Easter. Happy Easter Sunday um, for all those celebrating. Um, we are celebrating by returning to Enoch Powell's freedom and reality. I was hoping to have a guest on today, but it looks like that's fallen through. So unfortunately, it's just going to be me reading again. But um, I won't waste too much time. Let's get into it. Today we are going to hopefully get through chapter 11 on uh, illusions about defence. And we're actually, how much have we got left to go of the book? Uh, we're, we're about two thirds of the way through now, so we're, we're, it's all downhill from here. Okay, chapter 11, illusions about defence. Oh, if, um, if anyone does want to join, the uh, link is in the Discord. Um, and you're welcome to, to hop on and contribute. So, Chapter 11, Illusions About Defence. To have undergone the dramatic reversals and changes in world position which have been Britain's lot since 1945 renders a nation especially vulnerable to self-deception the most common and yet the most dangerous area in which to fall a prey of self-deception is defence. Britain must regain the ability to shape her defence policy in relation to what she really is and where she really is. The Arab-Israel Six-Day War in June 1967 threw some of Britain's defence illusions into sharp relief. It is not only in economic affairs that Britain has been haunted during the last 20 years by a severe inferiority complex, which came to a recent climax over devaluation. We have suffered from a similar and equally severe complex in our thinking about defence, and this, I fear, has not yet reached its climax. Just as economically we are overawed by the staggering statistical growth rates of other countries, so in defence we have been overawed by the size and visible power of the United States and the Soviet Union. This has induced a dangerous kind of paralysis, for when the idea gains ground that our defence effort is foredoomed to be ineffectual, it becomes easy to persuade people, particularly under a Labour government, and a Labour government with a left wing such as this one, that therefore a British defence can effort cannot be worth paying for. This state of national dejection has been fostered by causes peculiar to our time. The mere fact of Britain's relatively small size and resources does not account for it, because the fact is nothing new. What is new is that, in the last 20 years, one of the axioms of military power has been forgotten or denied. That is the axiom that military power is relative to distance. It is effective in inverse ratio to the distance in which it is exercised. Why this basic axiom has fallen into disregard is not difficult to explain. The world has been mesmerised since 1945 by the spectacle of nuclear power and the conquest of space. The megaton weapon and the satellite in orbit, not to mention the development of the rocket, have made it easy for the cliché to be mouthed and believed that space has been annihilated. Indeed, for some purposes, space virtually has been annihilated, but not for military purposes. For military purposes, short of mutual suicide, and that is the very opposite of the controlled and disciplined use of force which we call war, distance and geography are as significant today as they have ever been. <coughs> as they have ever been. But Britain has been more predisposed than any other nation to make the wrong deduction about the military importance of distance because of her recent past, or rather, a misrepresentation of her recent past. For Britain's geography has changed since World War II to a far greater extent than that of any other great power. Until 20 years ago, Britain was also India and her military geography, and uh, and her military geography and location was that of India as well as that of the British Isles. Consequently, the Indian Ocean stood in the same relation to Britain as the Eastern Atlantic and Southeast Asia in the same relation as the Balkans and the Baltic Sea. Thus the British got into the habit of thinking in what are sometimes called global terms. They were used to finding it easy, if not easier, and much more common to apply military power in the Persian Gulf or the Malacca Straits than in the Skagarek or the Straits of Gibraltar. 
they fell into the not unnatural error of supposing that this military power was exercised from and by the United Kingdom as such, and consequently that there had been a special dispensation or providence in their favour, whereby the law of the universal rate the law of the universe ratio did not apply to the products of the British public school system. Hence, it was an easy step for them to fail to draw the military conclusions from that profound change in Britain's military geography, which occurred, so far as such events can be precisely dated at all, in 1947. So what with nuclear fission and the Koh-i-Noor, we have contrived to our own discomfiture to ignore the military axiom of power and distance. In the last few years, however, there have been sharp reminders that military power does not exist in the abstract, but is a function of place. All these things happened for N samples. All these things happen for N samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's 1 Corinthians 10 to 11. There was one this year. Israel inflicted a decisive defeat on Egypt and Jordan. She did what Britain could not have done, and what the United States would have had the greatest difficulty in doing. Certainly we would have taken longer about it, and it would have been a mercy if the work had not been botched. This does not mean that Israel is a greater military power than Britain. It only means what we could see anyhow by looking at a map that Israel, that Israel lives there and we do not. Israel is now the principal military power in the Middle East, excluding Turkey, but she has no military power at all on the Straits of Dover or in the Low Countries. She doesn't live there. Khrushchev's brinkmanship in 1962, given that Russia did not regard the establishment of missile sites in Cuba as an adequate occasion for nuclear self-extermination, was resolved without a single pawn being taken off the chessboard. The United States could indisputably sink indis indisputably sink any vessel trying to get to Cuba, and if necessary, occupy the island. So as soon as it became clear that they were ready to do so, the show was at an end. It is no use having a long arm if the fingers and the hand at the end of it can be chopped off. Otherwise, either one's bluff is called or one loses. Conversely, observe the importance of geography in frustrating the American arms in Vietnam. It is not that the mere distance imposes uh, unacceptable limitations on the exercise of American physical power across the Pacific. On the contrary, the ocean, in a sense, links their advanced bases in the Western Pacific and the Southeast Asia with the home country. The point is that the Americans do not live in Southeast Asia, whereas the North Vietnamese and their neighbours do. Consequently, since the Americans do not intend to set up shop permanently in Southeast Asia, in effect to conquer, hardly any degree of military force, however great, could produce that decisive effect on their opponent's will, which is the meaning of victory. And to make a modern parallel, we, we essentially saw that with uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and, and so on and so on. Finally, to take an example of our own, Rhodesia. This country's policy towards Rhodesia since UDI has been so calamitous, exposing us to loss and derision because we overlooked the basic fact that Britain is incapable of exercising physical power in Central Africa. We have behaved as though Rhodesia and Rutland were for practical purposes interchangeable. When socialists, pacifists and liberals call for force to be used against Rhodesia, they are disclosing the fundamental misconception on which the whole policy was based. Militarily speaking, we aren't there, and we can't get there. The insight into the relationship between geography and military power is vital to a restoration of our confidence in ourselves and of a rational basis for our armed forces. It means that a nation's military strength and effectiveness is not absolute, so that it could be read off on a list of forces compiled out of reference books like Bracey's uh, Annual or Jane's fighting ships and arranged in order of size, but it is relative to its situation and environment. Any nation which is strong where it can be and needs to be strong and has successfully married place with force may be as formidable and as secure as those numerically much larger. The application of this principle to the United Kingdom produces what ought to be a truism, that it sounds more like a paradox is a measure of our neglect or oblivion of the axiom of the inverse ratio.
The United Kingdom is potentially strongest and most effective militarily in the Eastern Atlantic and Western Europe. A pound spent on the arms and preparation relevant to those theatres produces a higher return in military strength than a pound spent otherwise. The principle of superiority of force implies that in any theatre, policy will aim at operating with the maximum alliance. Yet still, it remains true that for a given outlay of resources upon defence, the greatest influence upon allies and the greatest insurance against their absence, defeat or defection is obtained by investment in the theatres where force is maximised by position. It is possible to go further. Out of the various forms of armament and preparation applicable to a theatre, those will yield the greatest return in strength, which derive the most reinforcement from the military geography. For example, Switzerland would derive more power from a given investment in fortifications and mountain troops than in armoured divisions. This observation in turn is reinforced by the principle that in strategic terms, aggression is much more expensive than defence. All this adds up to something particularly important for Britain at all times and especially at the present time. Uh, without inveterate with our inveterate love of falling between all the possible stools and of doing a bit of everything with superb competence on a completely inadequate scale, nothing is more salutary and necessary than the discipline of priorities and the obligation to concentrate. We have to counteract in our defence policy a long habit and tradition of dilettantism derived from distant wars against military inferiors and flag-showing cruises in neutral waters. War is about winning. War is about striking what matters most with all of one's might. Our present sense of inferiority, economic as well as military, is closely linked with our inability or reluctance to concentrate, and concentration involves renunciation, i.e. renunciation of many objectives to concentrate upon a few, renunciation of what one does indifferently to concentrate on what one does supremely. Let me sum up. The defence forces of a major power must keep some touch with every branch of military art, but a Britain which concentrated its defensive investment overwhelmingly upon the means of victory in the areas of its natural strength, the Eastern Atlantic and Western Europe, would find itself relative to its situation to be a military power not inferior in any way. We should not need to buttress our self-esteem by talking about its role and importance in the world. It would have them. World events in recent weeks, and especially those in the Middle East, could be a blessing in disguise for Britain, for any country, but perhaps above all for ours at this stage in its history. The most essential and often the most difficult condition of success is to recognise the truth about oneself. Self-knowledge, the old precept of the oracle, know thyself, is as needful for nations as for men. How many disasters, how many failures can be traced to delusions about the realities of the world we live in, to the self-hypnotism of make-believe? To many in Britain and to many abroad, well-wishers and foes alike, it has often seemed in recent years that this country lay bewitched under a kind of spell, like the Lady of Shalott in Tennyson's poem, who could not bear to look at daylight um, reality, but wove a tapestry of dreams from the shapes reflected in her mirror. Britain has seemed to live in an unreal world, all of her own, afraid to face the true one. As a result, she was eluded not only by unsubstantial shadows at which she grasped in vain, but by solid real achievement that lay within her capability and should have proved a cause for pride and given a purpose for the future of her rising generation. Sometimes it needs a shock or a series of shocks to break such a spell. It may be these recent events will prove to have been such. Indeed, I find among ordinary people everywhere much realisation of the plain facts of the world and much bewilderment and irration, that uh, an irritation that the talk of politicians appears so remote from those facts and so irrelevant to Britain's realities, it is little enough that politicians can achieve, but at least they can talk, and if from blindness or lack of courage they fail to find the words to speak what the mass of people want to hear expressed, then they betray the one trust which is reposed in them. The language of delusion. Too often, Britain's British politicians have been the most pertinacious, pertinacious in using the language of delusion. 
instead of telling the truths, however harsh and unpalatable, which ordinary people around them have already perceived, they might almost seem to be engaged in a conspiracy to fasten Britain's delusions more firmly upon her. In the last two years, we have had the Prime Minister and his colleagues informing not only the Labour Party in well-reported private meetings, but Parliament and the world at large, that Britain is to have a worldwide peacekeeping role and hold forces available to help to put out bushfires wherever peace is threatened. Well, in the last months, all this has been put to the test of reality. As soon as peace was threatened in the Middle East, an area on both sides of which considerable British forces are still actually stationed, an area of what is supposed to be traditional British influence, it promptly appeared that we could do nothing about it. What is more, government and parliament alike, so far as could be judged, practically all sections in this country were unanimous about one thing. We were determined not to get involved. As for our bases, Cyprus, Libya, and even Malta, we were informed that uh, we should not be permitted to use them. And the only thing that was heard about our naval forces in the Mediterranean was an official protestation that the carriers were moored 1,000 miles away from the fighting. Even this humiliation did not save us from reprisals for intervention, for an intervention of which we were absolutely guiltless. Never, perhaps, has there been a more classic instance of the famous manoeuvre of getting the worst of both worlds. When this happened, it promptly appeared that the so-called British presence, either in the Mediterranean or in the Persian Gulf, was powerless to protect our interests, either in oil or sterling. From the government of Iraq to the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi, those who wanted to just turned the oil taps off. And we, of course, rightly, never dreamt we could do anything to prevent it by our military presence, any more than we could have used force in the area to prevent sterling deposits from being withdrawn. On the contrary, it became obvious that it was just because we were physically present in the area that our oil and our reserves were in danger, when other peoples were not. European countries on the continent, whom we have been accustomed to lecture about the white man's burden, and how we keep the peace in those regions free of charge on their behalf, probably found all this much funnier than we did. By a strange irony, it so happened that almost unnoticed, a perfectly classic post-colonial bushfire was blazing away at the same time in West Africa, to the detriment of all manner of commercial interests, and to the threatened breakup of a country which Britain had literally brought into existence. I refer to Nigeria. Yet it never occurred to anyone, and rightly not, that Britain had had any other role in the matter than to avoid involvement and maintain a position as far as possible diplomatically correct. We had, in the past, launched the Federation of Nigeria to the best of our ability as a well-administered and viable country. In its future fortunes, we would have no greater hand than any other well-wisher and if any suggestion had come from either side in that country's unhappy division that we should do our stuff and put out the bushfire, our astonishment would have been exceeded by our alarm. <coughs> Make believe. These were the realities, but all the time government and the press kept up a constant barrage of make-believe. The British House of Commons was not saved from the tragic, tragicomic experience of being informed after Israel had fought her enemies to an armistice, that the ceasefire was most notably due to the efforts, you would never guess it, of Lord Caradon, the House of Commons, and the British Foreign Secretary congratulating themselves on having stopped the bloodshed, was a nauseating spectacle which made one sad and angry at the same time. These, if ever, are the fantastic tricks before the face of heaven which make the angels weep. Then there were the headlines about the Big Four, this and the big four that, which anywhere but in Britain would have represented an insoluble arithmetical puzzle. The big two, repeat two, were playing a game of poker, and all the rest were nowhere, and even the big two were significantly playing the game with a caution which showed how limited they realised the effectiveness of their giant strength might be. But between the little two, between France and Britain, there was this difference, this vital difference. France, after years of suffering and effort, only derided us and others. Um, for 
Folly de Grandieu had won through to self-knowledge and so was able to act in the light of the realities and her real power a not discreditable minor part. Britain, on the other hand, behaved like the King Lear. Now the analogy keeps forcing itself into any attempt to describe Britain's predicament. Declaiming to the tempest, I will do such things, what they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. How far remote all this is from the shrewd common sense and practical realism which we believe to be part of our national makeup. I do not think that the mass of our people who hear and watch these goings on like a show on the stage are much longer in a mood to be amused. They are not deceived. They know the difference between make believe and the real world. How much longer are they to be practiced upon by politicians who treat them like children to put to bed happy with a fairy tale? How much longer are we to be held back from exerting our real character, our real effort and our real resources in that world where all the rest are already living. It is time to be up. What is needed is to re-establish principles of national defence based on the abiding realities of Britain's situation. Three conference speeches delivered by the party spokesman on defence in Brighton in 1965, in Blackpool in 1966, and again in Brighton in 1967, can be seen as one continuing essay on this theme. So, 1st of October 1965. To defend this nation's existence and its continuity is the one object which a Tory places unconditionally above all others. That is easily said, but before the determination can be turned into policy, we have to ask and to answer a number of crucial questions. In the first place, what do we mean by the nation? I will say what I believe we mean. We mean the United Kingdom. Whatever, uh, whatever other meanings the words the British nation can have and do have, this is the sense in which we use them when Her Majesty's Government in the United Kingdom and the Parliament of the United Kingdom take measures for security and defence. Whatever obligations and commitments we have besides, the ultimate reason and the ultimate justification for those commitments is that we hold them to be necessary or advantageous for the defence of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is a European power. True, it has characteristics profoundly relevant to defence, which make it different from any other European power. But if the rest of Europe succumbed to an enemy, the safety of these islands would be even more precarious in the future than when that event has threatened or occurred in the past. Therefore, an alliance which can be which can successfully defend Western Europe against attack from the east, the only present direction from which danger is apprehended, is central to our defence policy. Forces and materials, which are needed for the purpose of that alliance, have an overriding claim on the resources which we can devote to our defence. Overriding with only one proviso, that no commitment be entered into which would irrevocably deny us all possibility of independent action to deter an enemy or to maintain our own existence, however unforeseeable the circumstances may now be in which that might be necessary. This means, among other things, that our right to control the use of our own strategic nuclear weapon must be retained to the limit of our ability, at least until military and political circumstances are profoundly different from what they are today. It is the merest it is the merest casuistry to argue that if the weapon and the means of using it are purchased in part or even altogether from any other nation, therefore the independent right to use it has no reality. With a weapon so catastrophic, it is possession and the right to use it which count. On the other hand, we could not, without forfeiting the possibility of ultimate self-defence, allow ourselves to be dependent on foreign supply of the requirements of a whole arm of our services. That is why we condemn policies which would leave British industry destitute of the capacity to produce by itself and to cooperate with other European countries in producing modern military aircraft or whatever may be destined to replace them in the third dimension of warfare in the future. As a European power, 
we also have to insure against the hazard that hostile operations on the continent might be so extensive and successful as to prejudice the safety of the United Kingdom without the nuclear curtain being rung down upon the scene. Here again, it is speculation, perhaps idle speculation, to try to describe circumstances in which war might be waged in Europe without the strategic nuclear weapon being invoked almost instantly. But any British government might shudder before the responsibility of resting the safety and the existence of this nation on the blind assumption that no such war which could endanger them would ever happen. He, for instance, who would risk destroying our territorial army as a force capable of training men and units for major war, or who would contemplate leaving this country without home defence, must be surer than I would dare to be that he himself knows exactly what such a war will and will not be like. So far as I have spoken about the supreme national interests, the defence of this realm, so far I have spoken about the supreme national interest, the defence of this realm. What are the other national interests which, though still secondary to that, might claim to share the resources we allocate to defence? One that is often mentioned is trade and access to raw materials. The freedom to buy and sell, to import and export, is indeed an obvious and vital interest of this nation. And it is of others, not least of other European nations. It may be that in the past trade followed the flag as the phrase went but whether that be so or not and my own reading of history would incline me to turn the maxim the other way around it has no validity today nations competitors of ours which depend equally or more on trade have outstripped our own performance without any military presence either in the areas from which their raw materials are derived in their from the areas which their raw materials are derived or in those where the principal markets are situated. Indeed, a military presence has more than once proved rather an obstacle than a safeguard to the development of trade, and hindered instead of promoting that recognition of mutual material interest, which is the only sure basis of all trade. I do not think a defence requirement for this country could easily be founded on our economic or commercial interests in themselves. <coughs> Often, however, these are seen as merging into another interest, that of containing communism. We do not, of course, mean communism literally, for communism, for communism is an abstract theory, and you do not shoot theories with bullets. We mean the Russian Empire, and in the second place, the Chinese Empire, both of which we apprehend might threaten Europe, and thus ourselves, by commanding the adjacent continents of Asia and Africa. This generation, which now has twice narrowly escaped destruction at the hands of a military empire which possessed only a private nationalistic creed, we cannot take lightly the danger of military empires armed with an ideology that claims to appeal to all mankind. It is in the solemn presence of that danger that the British government and people have nevertheless to weigh two great propositions with the utmost candour. One proposition is this. Assuming that Western military power could limit or be a factor in limiting the extension of the Russian and Chinese influence in Asia and Africa, we should still have to measure the practical effect of British military effort against the size of the resources it demands and the consequences of diverting them from other pressing uses, defensive as well as economic. The other proposition is this. However much we may do to safeguard and reassure this new in the new independent countries in Asia and Africa, the eventual limits of Russian and Chinese advance in those directions will be fixed by a balance of forces, which will itself be Asiatic and African. The two communist empires are already in a state of mutual antagonism, but every advance or threat or advance, but every advance or threat of advance by one or the other calls into existence countervailing forces, sometimes nationalist in character, sometimes expansionist which will ultimately check it. We have to reckon with the harsh fact that the attainment of this eventual equilibrium of forces may, at some point, be delayed rather than hastened by Western military presence. These are the great issues in Europe and in the world which any defence policy worth its name must weigh, without prejudice to the requirements of diplomacy or of military security, 
the nation must be told simply and firmly what are the assumptions on which its preparation for defence are based. Uh, 2nd of October 1966. This brief debate has drawn attention to two fundamental principles of defence policy. One is that means must be related to ends. We have to measure our outlays against the return which they produce in terms of security. Everyone who has spoken in this debate from different points of view has reiterated that simple but basic point. Defence expenditure. The second principle of which we have been reminded is that only those military obligations must be undertaken by a nation which it can and will perform. To do otherwise is to court disaster and disgrace for others as well as for oneself. Let us look for a moment or two at the application of these principles today. I doubt if it is realised at all widely how large a part in our balance of payments is played by the military expenditure which we undertake in foreign currency. Last year, for example, we, the industry, the commerce and the private assets of this country, earned a surplus of 273 million after investing abroad a further huge sum of 160 million. What converted this surplus into a deficit of 354 million was the government's expenditure in foreign currency, of which the largest sum, the largest item, 280 million, was military. Thus, our growing burden of external debit is not, as it often falsely, as is often falsely alleged, to enable us at home to live beyond our means, but to finance our effort, and principally our military effort, overseas. No other nation in the world except the United States is comparably situated for the simple reason that the military effort of other nations is normally nearly all within their own frontiers. Our defence expenditure in foreign currency falls into three main areas, Europe, the Far East and the Near and Middle East in the ratio of 4 to 4 to 3. In other words, Europe represents just under 40% and the rest just over 60%. I regret, however, to mention that there is a large fourth item just round the corner with which we shall soon be confronted. This is the cost of all the American aircraft which this government is buying on the Never Never. NATO commitment. Our outlays in Europe, of course, arise from our commitment under the North Atlantic Alliance, which reflects the basic and the indefeasible interests of this country in the security of Western Europe. The rest of our commitments, historically speaking, are the results directly or indirectly of our former imperial presence outside Europe, very largely of our one-time Indian Empire. Now, our commitments under the North Atlantic Alliance, implemented within the framework of NATO, are defined and precise, and Her Majesty's opposition will watch jealously any disposition of the government to default upon them. But in this respect of being definite and precise, these commitments in NATO are exceptional. Under the CENTO and SEATO treaties, for instance, the only formal obligation of the parties to them is to consult together, and their members are free to interpret and have, in fact, interpreted what is required of them in widely different senses, varying from zero upwards. We ourselves, for instance, have had air forces in Thailand under SEATO. On the other hand, the Americans are operating in Vietnam, not under SEATO, but under bilateral agreements. Commonwealth Link the Commonwealth Link does not in itself import a specific defence commitment. We are, for instance, not committed as Commonwealth partners to defend the territorial integrity of Ghana, nor, you may be surprised to hear, is Ghana committed to defend the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom. With some Commonwealth countries, of course, such as Australia and New Zealand, we have compelling ties of blood and sentiment. But even so, the express defence arrangements on which Australia and New Zealand depend for their security are not with us, but with the United States, which alone was able to protect them in World War II. On the other hand, we do, not, we do have an explicit commitment to Malaysia, which arose as its transition from colonial status to independence at its. Though curiously, there is at this moment still no treaty at all with Singapore, the use of which would be indispensable for carrying the commitment out.
In addition, we have one or two specific undertakings to individual states, such as Brunei, and at the other end of the scale, we share the wide and general obligations of the Charter with all other members of the United Nations. Treaties and alliances are like the domestic laws of countries in this respect. While they remain unchanged in form, the realities of power and circumstances are changing all the time around them. The business of statesmanship, internationally as well as nationally, is to find, if possible, the means of reconciling institutions and laws with the changes of real life. As we seek to do this, we have, I think, to keep firmly in the mind the second point which I mentioned at the outset, namely, neither to undertake nor to appear to undertake more than we can physically perform or would be willing to perform. History is littered with instances, some alas in our own history, when commitments that could not be fulfilled, when the testing time came, brought disaster on those who relied upon them and discredit on those who had given them. Everyone who has the honour as well as interest of Britain at heart will insist that our commitments and our capabilities should match. Capabilities in terms of the East have to be looked at realistically. Even the colossal strength of the United States is being put under strain in the effort to uphold the status quo in Vietnam. Meanwhile, our own capabilities have been altering rapidly, even dramatically. In a few months, the positions we occupy east of Suez will be restricted, apart from Singapore itself, to one or two places in the Persian Gulf and some islands in the Indian Ocean. This must clearly denote a very definite limit upon the sort of commitments which we can undertake there with the certainty of sustaining them. On the other hand, I have no patience with the pseudo-realists who imply that Britain no longer occupies this or that distant territory, or because she no longer has battalions and bases on which the sun never sets, therefore she can have no influence or confidence in the world and nothing to contribute to the defence of her friends outside Europe. This country, unique in its position, in its resources and its institutions, can never be negligible anywhere if she will provide herself with those forces which befit a nation essentially maritime, and at the same time essentially a part of Europe. Britain will certainly never achieve that under ad an administration which, in a brief two years ago, uh, in a brief two years has wrecked one concept of our naval strategy without replacing it by another, which has seriously, perhaps irreparably, damaged the army's citizen reserve, which has sacrificed our aviation industry in order to purchase a few highly expensive aircraft, the role of which has never yet been satisfactorily explained, and in administration, finally, which has done its best to contract Britain out of the advanced technologies of defence, above all in space. Number three, uh, October 1967. <clears throat> For the first few years after the Holocaust of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, people tried to persuade themselves that mankind's possession of unimaginable powers of destruction had, paradoxically, brought perpetual peace down to the earth. <clears throat> Sorry. With that dream neither reason with that dream neither reason nor the experience of the last twenty years can be reconciled. There is no ground for supposing that the possibility of violence between advanced nations has been abolished just because war itself is now bounded on the farther side by the abyss of self destruction. It follows that our nation, while maintaining its nuclear deterrent against nuclear assault, must still be prepared also to defend its existence, if necessary, by force of arms. It follows also, and equally necessarily, that our own preparation does nothing to make the eventuality of war more probable. We do not know in what form or in what circumstances a future threat to our existence may present itself. History is littered with the wars which everybody knew would never happen. A computer has not yet been invented which will tell us the future pattern of power in the world at large, or even in our own turbulent continent of South West Asia, commonly known as Europe. We do not know. We do know, however, the essential requirements of our country's defence in a form sufficiently general to meet all cases. Those requirements of our defence are basically two, 
The first is to retain for ourselves and deny to an enemy the means of access to these islands. The second is to maintain, and if it is lost, to restore the balance of power on the mainland which will prevent an enemy from dominating Western Europe successfully. These are requirements which remain valid, whatever is to be the future form and course of that closer association with our fellow Europeans to which we aspire. Today, Britain has on the continent what is a high officer. Today, Britain has on the continent what a high officer serving there described to me recently as the finest army Britain has ever had in time of peace, and one which is the envy of its allies. I believe him. It is that army which will be the basis not only of Britain's influence in the councils and concert of Europe, but of whatever British land forces may be needed in time to come to fulfil the second, the landward requirement of our defence, bearing in mind that at this point we haven't yet demolished the the kind of post-war standing army that we had in, in Western Europe. Um, uh, that, that comes a lot later. Um, but the future of the British Army has suffered three hammer blows at the hands of this administration. The first is the withdrawal shortly to take place of a formation from the continent in circumstances inconceivably ill-timed politically, circumstances which make it impossible to believe that other withdrawals are not intended to follow. The second blow is the announcement with no justification, other than an imaginary budget eight years ahead. And we know how good the socialist government is at estimating the national income six months ahead, that the fighting units of the army are to be cut by one quarter over that period of... So Powell is talking here about those cuts that I was talking about. The third blow, possibly in the end the worst blow of all, has been the halving of the territorial army and its reduction to the role of supplementing the present British army on the Rhine in one particular context. <coughs> If Britain is to remain a credible, not only to say leading, factor in the defence of Western Europe, we need to have a true citizen army, not only to provide the means of expansion in war, but also, I warn you I'm going to use a very old-fashioned expression, to keep alive in this country the military spirit and the will to self-defence. So much for the second requirement of our security. What of the first, the command of the air, the sea, and of the depths beneath it, whereon? If I may modernise, but not essentially alter, this application of these proud traditional words, under God's good providence, the safety, happiness and welfare of this realm do chiefly depend. One thing has become clear beyond dispute over the last two years. The government's decision to end our carrier force was taken in isolation, with no idea about what principles of maritime warfare were to succeed it. No armed service can retain its spirit and its efficiency forever without a clear knowledge and conviction of how and with what it is going to fight if it has to. For the Royal Navy, the fumblings of the government have involved that future deep in deep obscurity, but not for the Royal Navy alone. The story of aircraft procurement for the Royal Air Force under this government is an unpleasant tale of deception, half-truths and double-dealing. Here again, sweeping and hasty decisions were plunged into during the first months of office, and the track of any foresight or sound reasoning behind them was then covered up with, with a tissue of hopes and guesses given out for facts. The Anglo-French variable geometry aircraft, the American offset agreements, the fixed price for the modified F3K, and all the rest. This most basic of all British requirements, the command of our vital air and sea space, which has thus been put in doubt, not only to say severely prejudiced in these last three years, is in no narrow sense insular, still less local. For a nation which has that capability, the distinction urged ad nauseum between east of Suez and west of Suez is more than a little artificial. It implies a far sharper contrast and conflict than really exists. In the third of these speeches, the nuclear hypothesis was more openly challenged and repudiated than the others. A dramatic reinforcement to this case against the nuclear hypotheses arrived from the most unexpected of all quarters, the American Department of Defense. The nuclear mushroom cloud, which has hung over national defense policy for two decades, is at last rising into the stratosphere and dispersing. <clears throat> 
As it clears away, it discloses a landscape not unfamiliar. For years now, the opposition have been saying that we cannot, we must not, allow ourselves to be drugged with the idea that any war which threatened the safety and existence of this country would be bound to go nuclear almost at once. At our Brighton conference in 1965, I said that we have to ensure against the hazard that hostile operations might be so extensive and successful as to prejudice the safety of the United Kingdom without the nuclear curtain being rung down upon the scene. Since those words were spoken, a profound change of opinion on this subject has been gaining ground so far as our so far as our principal ally, the United States, is concerned, it has won through to open and official acceptance. I might summarise it in a sentence from Mr McNamara's statement to Congress two months ago. The threat of an incredible action is not an effective deterrent. It is impossible to exaggerate the significance of this change for ourselves, both as an island nation and a European power. An all-out war at sea. The last two decades have been the first period for 300 years when the maritime forces of this country have not had it as their prime object and capability to prevent an enemy from blockading these islands or gaining access to them by sea. This has happened because we had persuaded ourselves that a long war at sea, such as we have had to face several times in our history, was no longer to be reckoned with. The very possibility was scouted. We slept secure in our hammock, suspended between the assumed alternatives of no war or nuclear suicide. This assumption, which of course has nothing to do with the perfectly rational theory of the nuclear deterrent to nuclear war or blackmail, was always logically and indeed morally difficult to sustain. It has now been abandoned um, it has now been abandoned by our principal ally, the United States, which now officially envisages the possibility of what they call an all-out war at sea, lasting months, if not years, which would be fought and could be won without going nuclear at all. In short, the scales have been struck from people's eyes, and the war at sea involving, as in the past, the safety and survival of this country has been recognised to be still in the future the supreme contingency of British defence policy. A corresponding and almost more dramatic change of scene has taken place. And again, bear in mind, Powell is talking at a time where the task force that was sent to the Falklands um, some years after this was bigger than our entire Navy is today. So again, bear, bear that in mind. Um, a corresponding and almost dramatic change of scene has taken place on land. Hitherto, the alternative of no serious war or nuclear suicide has accepted, was accepted because it was assumed that a potential enemy had overwhelming superiority of non-nuclear force and that any ordinary resistance to his onslaught would be impossible for more than a matter of hours. This assumption has been torn up. The appreciation publicly and officially stated by our ally, the United States, is now that a rough equality of forces exists in Europe between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, and that... Through the, though the balance would swing first one way, then the other after mobilisation, it would not permanently incline against NATO. No wonder this new appreciation implies the possibility not only of a war at sea, but of a prolonged conventional operation on the continent. This is not all. The political background of the Warsaw Pact forces has to be taken into account. The Soviet divisions in East Germany are there at least as much with East Germany itself in view as to confront... Let me start there again. This is not all. The political background of the Warsaw Pact forces has to be taken into account. The Soviet divisions in East Germany are there at least as much with East Germany itself in view as to confront NATO. The forces of the Iron Curtain countries cannot simply be added to those of the Soviet Union. There are circumstances imaginable and increasingly imaginable when it would be nearer the truth to subtract them. There is a proverb about the man who held a wolf by the ears. The Russian equivalent of that proverb must often occur to the men in the Kremlin. The long, deep frost which has lain upon Central and Eastern Europe for 20 years will not endure forever. 
Sooner or later, the ice flows will begin to move and the pieces of the European kaleidoscope to resemble themselves in new patterns. An army in being. All this is immediately relevant to British defence policy, for it means that if Britain is to have an influence in the European balance of power, so vital to her safety and even her existence, we must have an army that can be described in terms often repeated by the opposition, which I make no apology for repeating again. An army in being, equal in armament, training and philosophy to any other in Europe, and of such dimensions and structure, and supported by such reserves, as to be able, and to be seen to be able, to play an important and continuing part in continental warfare, if that ever came, a part which would make it the cement and fulcrum of the indispensable alliance. The demolition of the nuclear hypothesis is necessary not only for a rational approach to the future of Britain's own own armed forces, but to the rethinking of her part in the defence of Europe. My conclusion is that in the nuclear age, no less than in the pre-nuclear age, the defence of Britain is bound up with the denial of the adjacent mainland to an actual or potential enemy. Gosh, this is a long chapter. (laughs) Europe and the balance of power. The question next arises, what for this purpose is the meaning of adjacent? This is not a question which can be sensibly answered on technical or mechanical grounds. As if, for instance, the range of conventional weapons of long-range bombardment could be drawn as an arc on the map of Europe (coughs) to represent the frontier of Britain's security. <clears throat> Obviously, the remoter parts of Europe are of less direct relevance for the defence of Britain than the nearer. The situation in the low land, low countries, uh, must be of more intense preoccupation than in Bohemia or the Ukraine. Oh, uh, but that statement is a mere truism from which no deductions of policy can be drawn. When Stanley Baldwin in 1935 spoke of Britain's frontier on the Rhine, those who had heard him may have thought of the range of the then bomber aircraft, but in fact he was making a political and not a technical or tactical statement. For purposes of defence, adjacency is a political concept and must consequently vary according to changes in the political situation on the continent of Europe we cannot discover the definition of it by looking at a physical map. This is a fact which has been obscured in the last 20 years by the existence and the nomenclature of the Iron Curtain, which has inculcated a linear concept of defence and of adjacency. The state of tension along the frontier, above all, where it runs through pre-war Germany, um, the dramatic character of the Berlin Wall, the ne plus ultra motto of the nuclear doctrine in all its forms, but especially the concept of the triple wire, the tripwire, which was set off the booby trap of mutual nuclear annihilation. All these have conspired to present the adjacent mainland as an area more or less precisely defined. There is perhaps a deeper psychological cause which has commended this notion. This is the perpetual human longing to reach a state of permanence and finality, an ultimate solution after which Uh, there shall be no more change. This conduces to a linear, cut-and-dried concept of security to be achieved once and for all by making peace permanent peace across this line. In the real world, change is continuous, which is not to say the same, which is not to say the same as uniform or regular. Consequently, the lines move and disappear to be replaced by others elsewhere and the boundaries and meaning of adjacency shift accordingly. Balance of power has enjoyed a bad press since Sarajevo. The fact that in 1914-18, to what proved in the event so nearly equal a balance was tested to destruction, and the fact that no stable balance was ever reconstructed between 1918 and 39, have associated the idea of balance itself in the minds of millions with, that, with the guilt of carnage as if in the absence of balance there would be no conflict. 
Yet the Iron Curtain itself is a contemporary expression of the balance of power, and as long as the ebb and flow of change continue, the denial of the adjacent mainland to an enemy of Britain will depend on a balance of power, and the chance of peace or of survival upon the skill and wisdom, as well as good luck, with which that balance can be maintained through the successive alterations and readjustments which will be necessary. Accordingly, the basic requirement of Britain's defence redefines itself as the maintenance of such balance of power, as will prevent hostile use of the adjacent mainland. Thus, the idea of adjacency is subordinate to and derived from the balance of power. The post-war world. The end of war, or rather, to be precise, as we have lately got into the barbarous habit of winning wars, the end of a victorious war, is a moment of acute instability. Uh, The balance of power has been decisively destroyed, and therefore a new balance is imperatively demanded and instantaneously created out of the only available materials, namely the victors. Hence the phenomenon which was experienced once again after 1945, and received as recurrent and predictable human phenomena always are, by the vulgar, with shocked astonishment. The phenomenon of allies falling out, but per, but for the Bolshevik revolution, the phenomenon in more or less its contemporary form would probably have occurred already in 1918. The end of World War II, like that of previous great struggles for our existence, found Britain in possession of large and fine land resources, playing initially as in 1815 and 1918, the role of occupation forces on a defeated enemy soil. What distinguishes our experience in the last 20 years from the aftermath of previous great struggles is that the new balance of power emerged so swiftly and sharply that Britain's European forces were converted by a rapid but smooth transition into a standing contingent of an alliance with its forces on Uh, on what could be regarded as virtually a war footing. This continued existence during 20 years of large British operational land and air forces on the mainland could be for Britain one of the most important and pregnant events in her history. There has never been anything remotely like it before. Silently and unawares, fate has placed a new instrument in Britain's hand, perhaps comparable with her former capabilities of providing industrial capital or of policing the oceans. The crucial transformation dates from 1948, when, after the Russian coup in Czechoslovakia, the Brussels Treaty powers, being Britain, France and Benelux, made a defensive alliance and set up a common defence system. And from 1949, when the North Atlantic Alliance was formed, Uh, following the blockade of Berlin. The North Atlantic Alliance added two elements, the North American powers, the USA and Canada, and the countries on the north and south flanks of Europe, Iceland, Norway and Denmark in the north, and Portugal, Italy, and subsequently Greece and Turkey on the south. Finally, the status of Western Germany was changed from that of an occupied country to that of an allied power. In 1954, Germany, with Italy, joined the Brussels powers in Western European Union, and in 1955 she acceded to the North Atlantic Alliance. The two elements which are peculiar to the North Atlantic Alliance, as distinct from Western European Union, the transatlantic and the peripheral powers, are of crucial crucial importance for a judgment of the future of of the European balance of power. As part of the victorious armies and occupation forces, the United States and Canada were present on the continent in strength after 1945, and underwent the same transformation of their posture in 1948, as did Britain. But for them this marked a new balance of power, not so much in Europe as in the world, for the other side of Russia, not to mention China, confronted them in their character of the victors over Japan across their mare nostrum, the Pacific. Indeed, in form, the North Atlantic Treaty affords the same protection to the Pacific coast of Canada and the USA as to the eastern frontier of the German Federal Republic. Atlantic Alliance is a new world concept. The counterpart of it would be um, Pacific Alliance, 
the fringe countries on both flanks of the North Atlantic, Iceland and Portugal, to which the USA was separately adding her alliance with Spain, and the fringe countries on both flanks of Russia in Europe, being Norway, Denmark, Greece and Turkey, belong to the same world picture. My screen just went off. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, the other element which the North Atlantic Alliance brought was the dependence. Real <clears throat> the other element which the North Atlantic Alliance brought was the dependence, real or supposed, but in any case official, of the alliance upon American nuclear capability. This in turn had two logical consequences. One was the transfer of the seat of effective military authority to Washington. The other was the establishment of a military command structure in Europe, which, in accordance with the theory of nuclear response, had to be comprehensive and, for practical reasons, American. It was these elements and their consequences which were to result in France eventually dislocating, disassociating itself from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1966, and in the unitary command structure having to be removed from French soil. Um, British forces in Europe. The size of the British forces on the mainland has progressively reduced since 1948-49 under the influence of three causes, apart from finance. These being reliance upon the nuclear power of the United States, the recreation of a substantial West German military power within the alliance, and the reduced apprehension of Russia associated with Sino-Russian estrangement and the rise of and bellicosity of China. At the Lisbon Conference of the North Atlantic Council in February 1952, the Allies accepted military goals of 50 divisions and 4,000 aircraft, which have never been reached and have become a byword. The big British reduction took place in 1957, on the ground that Britain could no longer continue to make disproportionately large contribution the Defence White Paper of that year, CMND 124, announced that in the following 12 months, BAOR, that's the British Army on the Rhine, would be reduced from 77,000 to 64,000, and further reductions would be made thereafter, and that aircraft strength on the continent would be halved. Um, reference was made in both contexts to nuclear weapons, e.g. The, the reduction will be offset by the fact that some of our squadrons will be provided with atomic bombs. Another part of the context was the decision to end conscription over the following five years. World War II and its aftermath were over at last, were over at last and Britain was reverting to a peacetime basis. By March 1958, agreement had been secured to a further reduction of BAOR in that year to 55,000 and a new note was struck. The financial problem involved in maintaining these forces in Germany. The cost at £47 million pounds, uh, in Deutschmarks would place a heavy additional burden on Britain's balance of payments, and HMG have been obliged to state that in the event of, an ad of adequate financial assistance not being forthcoming, they will reluctantly have to reconsider the size of the British land and air forces they can afford to retain on the continent. This is no place to discuss the nature of the balance of payments problem which has plagued Britain during the last 20 years, but its connection with defence on the mainland was both novel and important, for the size and disposition of forces was thus subordinated not to economic limitations as such, but to currency policies. The economic cost of maintaining a given force is, in principle, the same whether it is inside or outside the national frontiers. The same amount of manpower is withheld from other uses. The same services have to be provided for maintaining a military force instead of for other purposes. And the same productive capacity has to be devoted to equipping and arming it. The only difference when the force is outside national territory is that part of the outlay is indirect by way of exchange of goods and services instead of direct. Thus, instead of the force being served by its own nationals, it is served by foreigners in return for goods or services produced from them and rendered to them, directly or indirectly, by the home economy. The effect of stationing more forces outside one's own territory is that more of the economic cost is borne in the form of goods and services produced for exchange and less in the form of goods and services produced for internal consumption. <clears throat> 
In the extreme case, therefore, if a nation could produce absolutely nothing which the rest of the world wanted, it would be unable to station any forces outside its frontiers as its own at its own expense, except in enclaves wholly maintained from home. In practice, the effect is to in exert proportionately more demand for other nations' currency relative to one's own, so that other imports are, repress, are, are repressed to the extent necessary and exports are to the same extent stimulated. So long, however, as the exchange rates of the respective currencies are fixed, this does not happen, and so the cost of forces overseas in, for instance, Deutschmarks, becomes an additional burden on Britain's balance of payments, resulting in a larger deficit or lesser surplus. Thus it happens that a nation like Britain, which may be willing to maintain forces overseas and pay the full economic cost of them, becomes a suitor to other countries, begging not for subsidy or support costs, but for them to take more of its exports than they otherwise would, and therefore offset. Admittedly, even the latter contains in reality an element of subsidy, for there is some loss implicit in buying more than one wants, or buying it from a source other than one would have chosen. And indeed, the offsetter is getting a raw deal to the extent that he is accepting less favourable terms of trade than the real ones. Besides this, there are endless practical complications in making sure that the extra purchases are really extra, and would not, in whole or part, have been made anyway. Since 1958, therefore, the existence of a deficit in Britain's balance of payments at the, re at the prevailing rates of exchange has imposed an artificial limitation on her freedom to decide the role and location of her forces and has introduced an unwanted cause of friction into her relations with her allies. The problem is one which does not affect country, a country such as West Germany, whose defence requirements would, in any case, locate her forces in her own national territory. By 1964, the number of British troops on the mainland was down to 51,350, and the Conservative government was striving to bring this number up to 55,000, as required under the Brussels Treaty. The United Kingdom, having given an undertaking at Paris in October 1954 to maintain on the continent forces equivalent... Um, uh, to those then assigned to the Supreme Allied Commander, Europe, four divisions and the 2nd Tactical Air Force. From the outset, the Socialist government was critical of this commitment on the ground that it is impossible to conceive of a land campaign in Europe lasting for many days, and in May to July of 1966, they announced unilaterally their decision to bring back from the continent all or any forces of which the foreign exchange costs were not met or offset. Protracted negotiations with the USA and West Germany, which followed, issued in the announcement on the 22nd of May 1967, that for the year 67-68, the foreign exchange costs of all but a brigade group, that's five, five to 6,000 troops, and an air squadron would be offset, and that these latter forces would be withdrawn. Simultaneously, the American government announced that early in 1968, they, on their part, would withdraw 35,000 men from West Germany to the United States. The British government, moreover, made no secret of their desire to obtain agreement to much lower force levels, and the American announcement was received in the USA as the start of a continuing process of withdrawal. <coughs> Bear with me. Three factors for change. The balance of power in Europe and the alignment established at the end of the 1940s have proved astonishingly durable and slow to alter, but there are at least three factors which appear now, 20 years afterwards, to be working in the direction of a major, though not necessarily, a rapid rearrangement of the balance. One is the slow loosening of the hold of the Soviet Union over the states of Eastern Europe, which are increasingly demonstrating their will and their ability to seek their own international relations, and the fact that Russia cannot, even if it would prevent them from doing so. Even if, and that Russia cannot, 
even if it would prevent them from doing so. The growth of prosperity and even of the freer forms of economic organization in Russia and the other communist states may not be unconnected uh, with this trend, which is slowly leading to contacts with Western Germany and perhaps even to the rise of a certain sense of community in Mittel Europa. This connects with the second factor, one which is in no sense new, but one which changes in significance with every change in the international background. This is the unfinished business of the reunification of Germany. The continued rise of West German economic power, the loosening up in Central and Eastern Europe, the Franco-German Accord, the passage of time as World War II recedes into the past, the meteoric improvement in the East German economy since the Berlin Wall was built, and not least the change uh, in Russo-American relations, all combine to warn that the question of German reunification is not dead, but sleepeth. After a long sleep, such questions can awake with unsuspected suddenness and vigour. Finally, there is the shift in the world balance of power brought about by the Sino-Soviet break, the growing significance of China as a great power, and the deep commitment of the United States in Southeast Asia. Tentatively, as yet, and not without embarrassment, these developments are encouraging an understanding and modus vivendi between the USA and Soviet Russia, such as would not have been easy to imagine only five years ago. Boy, has that changed. Uh, It is much too early to discover, and it would be folly to attempt to prophesy what new balance and pattern of power in Europe these changes portend. What is certain is that they will be of vital concern to the defence of Britain, and that the continued presence and commitment of a large British force on the continent uh, give Britain an influence on the course of these events out of all proportion to what she would exert if that force were not there. It is possible to gauge this influence negatively by, for instance, assessing the effect not only in Western but also in Eastern Europe of a British withdrawal combined with the American reduction in forces and involvement. This relative position of Western Germany would be dramatically altered and all the other forces in Europe would begin to rearrange themselves accordingly. The continuance of major British forces on the continent as an integral element in the European sense is thus a requirement of Britain's defence and ought to be an object of its policy. Almost in parentheses, it should be added that purely technical and professional considerations point decisively in the same direction. It is not much of an exaggeration to say that the survival of a British army appropriate to a nation of Britain's size and situation and capable of being used to decisive effect if the balance of power in Europe were forcibly disturbed depends upon the presence of major British forces on the continent. When, in the comparatively near future, the forces stationed outside Europe have shrunk to small dimensions, the British army will be an essentially European army. The morale, the training, the thinking, the philosophy of such an army would be infinitely harder to create and maintain in the absence of a firm raison d'etre and a second home on the mainland of Europe. The security of Western Europe. It is not without importance that the specific commitment under which British forces of a given size are on the mainland is a commitment to Western European Union. This reflects the basic fact that the security of the British Isles is bound up with Western Europe. It separates that permanent commitment in form, as it is separated in fact from our wider affiliation with other European states and with the North America. American countries in the North Atlantic Alliance, an affiliation which corresponds with a less fundamental and more temporary grouping of powers. The distinction is convenient as it happens for another reason. Although France remains a party to the North Atlantic Alliance, she has severed her connection with NATO, the executive and institutional structure of the alliance. She has not similarly disassociated herself from Western Europe from Western European Union, though the latter's military functions are exercised through NATO, as long as NATO exists, are, so to speak, placed in commission with NATO. Sorry, that is a really confusing sentence. There's a lot of full stops there that aren't full stops. Um, 
let's try that again. Although France remains a party to the North Atlantic Alliance, she has severed her connection with NATO, the executive and institutional structure of the alliance. She has not similarly disassociated herself from Western European Union, though the latter's military functions are exercised through NATO as long as NATO exists, are, so to speak, placed in commission with NATO. On the contrary, France has been at pain since leaving NATO to assert that her security remains bound up with that of the rest of Western Europe, above all Western Germany, where, Fran where French forces continue to be located under a separate agreement. NATO and the North Atlantic Alliance itself are thus not the be-all and end-all of Britain's military presence on the continent. It would be idle to pretend that this presence is not closely relevant to Britain's aspiration to join in the economic cooperation of Western Europe, which has found expression in our recent application to join the European Economic Community, the precursor to the EU. Uh, this will be to, this will to, the will to permanent economic cooperation between the Western European nations and their impulse to combine in the fields of space, atomic energy and heavy industry, not to mention arms production, have inevitable overtones of defence. Political unity is inseparable from defensive unity, and to move towards the one is to move towards the other. Certain broad but definite conclusions for Britain's defence policy emerge. One is that Britain has a profound interest in sustaining an alliance of Western European powers in which she would participate with substantial force on the mainland of Europe and which would have a permanent common organisation for planning, armament and training. This requirement would not cease or be weakened if changes in Europe and the world at large were to render the present form of the North Atlantic Alliance obsolete. On the contrary, an, an alliance of the same general character would still be necessary. It might perhaps be based on Western European Union, and it would be likely to have roughly the same membership as WEU. Whether or not such an alliance with a British presence on the mainland proves sustainable in the long run, the size, character and organisation of Britain's forces, and particularly of her army, ought to be such as to make it clear that their principal function is to be effective in maintaining a European balance of power calculated to deny the mainland of Western Europe to an enemy of Britain. And so ends chapter 11. Um, thank you for all of those who've tuned in for all or part of today's stream and again for all of those who may watch in the future. Um, the next chapter um, again probably has some relevance to modern day and in fact we've got uh, three chapters left so the next chapter is illusions about commonwealth, the chapter 13 is on immigration and chapter 14 uh, is myth and reality so we've probably got three more Sundays worth of reading. Um, Anyway, thank you for tuning in. Hope you have a, a great Easter Sunday uh, and can think about the the meaning of uh, our Saviour sacrifice. Have a good day.